We're going to talk now about the law of large numbers, or in particular, the weak law of large numbers. Um, we're first going to understand the idea behind the law of large numbers a little bit, maybe about in the intuition of the law of large numbers, see an empirical example. And then we're going to look at um, tools used in the proof of the law of large numbers. And then we are going to apply those tools to actually prove the weak law of large numbers. And in another video, I will go through the proofs of those individual tools. Those tools are Chebyshev's inequality and the fact that the variance of a sample mean of IID observations scales like one over the number of observations. A canonical question of a lot of importance in, in statistics is how do we estimate a population mean? So let's imagine we have observations drawn independently and identically from a distribution f that is unknown on the real numbers, and we would like to estimate the expectation of a random variable x drawn from that distribution f. So we're imagining we have n iid observations, the sort of simplest, most classical, and in many cases best estimator of that population mean is the sample mean. Here we just take the empirical average of those n observations, so the sample mean given by this formula. And the sample mean is really a canonical object of study, both because we care about estimating, you know, in particular this population mean, and we think about sampling to do that, and also because when we engage with lots of other estimators, regression-based estimators, semi-parametric estimators, even some machine learning estimators, we find that we can often reduce these to the study of the sample mean. There's often um, what's called first order behavior and higher order behavior. And the first order behavior really determines asymptotically what's going on with these estimators. And to first order, these estimators often look like sample means of derived variables. So we're gonna get much more into that as we move forward. All right, so the weak law of large numbers says that under some very mild conditions, as n goes to infinity, this sample mean converges in probability to the population mean. This is quite important. It basically tells us that the sample mean could be a useful estimator for estimating the population mean, right? One thing you would like in an estimator is so-called consistency, which means that your estimator converges in probability to what you're trying to estimate if, you're, if your sample is large. Um, it turns out the sample mean has other useful properties that we will talk about later, but this is sort of maybe the, the most basic one to engage with. In what follows and in our proof, we are going to assume that each of these observations, x drawn from this distribution f, have bounded variance, which isn't strictly necessary, but it's, it's quite a mild assumption and makes the proof and calculations much more intuitive. Let's just look at a graphic example of the weak law of large numbers in action um, before we actually engage with proving that result. So for now, I'm going to take my x's to be iid draws from an exponential distribution with rate parameter 1 or mean 1. In this case, it's the same thing. The expectation of each x is 1. And so the weak law of large numbers tells us that the sample mean should have a sampling distribution that concentrates around 1 once n is sufficiently large. So we can look at the sampling distribution for, here I'm calling it x bar 1. It's a single draw from an exponential distribution. Um, there should be no mass to the left of 0. But unfortunately, because I did this empirically, I actually drew a bunch of exponential 1s in R and smoothed it to estimated density. We see there's a little bit of overflow to the left of 0. Don't worry about that for now. So this is approximately the sampling distribution for a single exponential random variable. Now we have the sampling distribution for the average of two independent exponential random variables. Both of these sampling distributions, by the way, should have mean equal to one, but we see that they're very asymmetric. They are not gathered about one. So if we look at the average of three, we see, okay, the tail is starting to come in right on both sides. The hump is starting to move towards one. We could go up to five, right? It's getting even closer. We could jump from here to say 60. Now it's really starting to peak at one. We go up to 150, we're even closer to one. We can go up to 500, we're really closing in. And maybe here we have the sample mean of 5,000 independent exponential one random variables. And here we see we are very sharply peaked at one and see very little mass, say outside of 
0.9 to 1.1. And as, as this number 5,000 increases to 10,000, 100,000, etc., we will see we really concentrate at one. Later, we will be able to actually strongly characterize the width of the sampling distribution and the shape. As we zoom in, the width would be a function of n, the number of independent observations we're drawing and averaging. But for now, we're not going to worry about that. But again, we see that the weak law of large numbers, as it should, appears to hold in this case, that um, the sample mean as n gets large has a distribution that concentrates around the population mean of 1. Now let's think about how we're going to engage with this mathematically to prove this result. So to prove that the sample mean converges in probability to the population mean, we're going to need to do two things. One, we're going to need to show that the sample mean is centered in the right place. It's centered at that population mean. And the other is we're going to need to show that the spread of that sample mean is controlled, and in particular that it converges to zero as n increases. And maybe I should say the spread of the sampling distribution of the sample mean is controlled. And so going back here, right, we would like to show again, that the center of the, the sampling distribution is at one, and that again, as we see empirically, as n gets bigger, that width, the spread of that distribution decreases. To understand the center, we can actually directly look at the expectation of the sample mean, and it's straightforward to show that that is actually the expectation of any single observation. That is the population mean that we're trying to look at. So that's a simple calculation. It's centered in the right place. For spread, things are a little bit trickier. We know if we want to prove that something converges in probability, um, what do we need to do? We need to consider an arbitrary tolerance, epsilon, and show that with probability converging to 1, x bar n will be within epsilon of the population mean, or equivalently, with probability converging to 0, it will fall outside of that epsilon tolerance. And this needs to be true for every epsilon. However, directly calculating that probability for an arbitrary distribution when all we know is that its variance is less than infinity is very non-trivial. <laughs> Instead of directly engaging with that quantity, we're going to use and learn about a very clever tool that will let us control this quantity right, that we really directly care about for convergence and probability with another quantity. In particular, we'll see with the variance which is something that we can understand and engage with. And this is a very common thing in stat theory. Sometimes you can do very direct calculations. Often you can't do direct calculations. They're very hard, convolutions, sums of random variables are difficult to engage with. So you use some other tool that is easier to calculate and you find a result relating that quantity that is easier to calculate to the quantity we're actually interested in. To do the second part, to show that this probability gets small as n gets large, um, we are going to engage with two very important, like foundational ideas in asymptotic statistics. Um, so the first idea is that we can bound this, what's often called a tail probability, the probability of exceeding some tolerance epsilon in distance from its expectation using the variance of the sample mean. So again, bounding a tail probability with a variance very important idea, and we'll talk about that in a second. And the second thing we're going to do is there's a beautiful relationship, which I'm going to state here and we will prove in a different video, and that is that the variance of the sample mean um, is exactly equal to the variance of each single observation divided by the number of observations that we are averaging over. So this is only true for independent observations. But again, this says that variance quantity, there's this really nice relationship. As you take averages over more and more observations, the variance decreases and converges to zero as n gets big at exactly this rate of one over n, right? This precise relationship holds. This relationship is actually often why we care about the variance over other moments, the third moments, the fourth moments, etc they don't have this nice relationship. So if you ever wondered, why do we care about the variance and its square root, the standard deviation, rather than the mean absolute deviation or any of these other things, it's generally because of this. Okay, so again, two pieces. 
bounding a tail probability in terms of the variance and understanding the variance and showing that it goes to zero. If we can connect those two pieces, it seems reasonable that we can say this probability then goes to zero and we can substitute in the population mean for this expectation of the sample mean. So maybe it's three steps, but I think these two are really the key ideas. So we're gonna go a little bit more into this idea one, how do we bound a tail probability using variance? The way you do this is with what's called Chebyshev's inequality. And so this holds not just for sample means, but any random variable with a variance that is less than infinity. So imagine we have a random variable Z um, and it has a variance that is bounded that we're gonna call sigma squared. Then the following inequality holds for any positive epsilon the probability, this tail probability, that z is further away from its expectation than epsilon can be bounded by the variance of z divided by epsilon squared. Right, and so we can see that if the variance goes to zero for any fixed epsilon, then this thing is gonna go to zero, right? Which is exactly what we want. So this is really a key idea that variance is a meaningful measure of the spread of a distribution in part because an inequality like this holds. There's an equivalent way to write this where we've sort of rescaled things. Now again, if sigma squared is the variance, sigma is the standard deviation. And so this says the probability that z is more than epsilon standard deviations from the expectation of z is less than or equal to one over epsilon squared. So um, that was a lot to parse, but I, I really like this bottom formulation, though the top is sometimes more useful for proofs. The bottom says for any random variable with a bounded variance or bounded standard deviation, the probability that the random variable will be more than 10 standard deviations, say, away from its mean is less than one over 100. Right? And that is true for any random variable with a variance that exists that is not infinity. Anyhow, Chebyshev's inequality, critically important. Um, we're not going to go into the proof now. It's not very long. We'll, we'll engage with that in another video. So now, to prove the weak law of large numbers, assuming we believe or have proved those two statements, we just take Chebyshev's inequality and everywhere we had a z, we plug in the sample mean. So we get the probability that the sample mean is further than epsilon from its expectation is less than or equal to the variance of the sample mean divided by epsilon squared. And if we plug in two things, one is that the expectation of the sample mean is the population mean. So that goes in here. And the other is that the variance of the sample mean is the variance of a single observation divided by the number of observations, right? That's going to go in here then we directly get this, the probability that the sample mean is further from the population mean than epsilon is some quantity that doesn't depend on n times one over n. So as n gets big, this will always go to zero. We are done. We have proven the weak law of large numbers.